Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It's not a responsible way to handle the, the budget. A dispute over state finances in the unlikeliest of places. Nowhere in the state of Louisiana are there rapid stabilization mental health centers. Why the capital region is trying to serve as a beacon. I was a writer many years before I started forensic anthropology at LSU. The edit to Mary Manheim's title as the Bone Lady. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, some relief beginning Saturday morning at 7 o'clock for people who rely on the Sunshine Bridge. For the first time since that barge collision October 12th, two lanes of the bridge will open to traffic. This while work continues on damage to the bridge to open it fully sometime in the coming weeks, which could be ahead of schedule. It is officially scheduled to open though fully sometime in January 2019. Now let's look at some headlines making news across Louisiana. Monday is the day Republican U.S. Senator John Kennedy announces whether he'll challenge John Bell Edwards in the run for governor. It's believed Kennedy would be a tough opponent if he chooses to try and unseat Edwards in next year's election. He would join fellow GOP member Eddie Rispone, a businessman who's never held an elected office, and U.S. Representative Ralph Abraham from Richland Parish, who is said to be leaning toward running. The Secretary of State's office will have to start all over in its work to replace decade-old voting machines. The governor's administration this week refused to reinstate a voided multi-million dollar contract award, saying to cancel that deal was in the best interest of the state. The state GDP, gross domestic product figure for the second quarter of 2018, is the highest on record for Louisiana, $249.7 million. The data comes from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and noted that our rate of 4.3% growth outpaces the national average of 4.2%. Skilled trades teachers from New Orleans are among 18 winners in a national contest called Tools for Schools. Joshua Overman of New Orleans Charter Science and Math High School and Adam Bourne of the Net Charter High are among 15 second place prize winners. Both teach carpentry in addition to other skills. The homeless in New Orleans are getting some help from Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and his Day One Families Fund. A $5 million grant is going to Catholic Charities of New Orleans on their behalf. It will help homeless in South Louisiana. Catholic Charities is one of 24 nonprofits to receive a portion of the more than $97 million being doled out across the country by the fund. In the eight years since the Deepwater Horizon spill of 2010, the oyster industry across the Gulf Coast has been decimated. Many billions of subtitle oysters lost and most Gulf states struggling, except us. Marine conservationists say Louisiana is the only state producing at a level at or higher than before the spill. Louisiana produces more oysters than any other state in the country. Well, this week, the state's revenue estimating conference did not approve new revenue numbers that would have given the state a little more money to work with moving ahead. Appropriations Chair Cameron Henry gave the no vote. Of course, it needs to be a unanimous vote. This after both the legislature's economist and state's economist projected an improved revenue forecast because of an improved economy. And here to talk about what happened this week, Commissioner of Administration Jay Darden, the governor's chief budget advisor and LSU economist, Dr. Jim Richardson. Oil prices have fallen 25% or so this past month. So that's, that's a factor. Would that have been a reason for this no vote from Cameron Henry? Put your thoughts on that, Jim. Well, 
I, I don't think that was the only reason that that is a reason. I, we'd already talked about the prices that they put into the budget or in the forecast were a little bit higher than I felt were good. And we talked about how to reduce those. So we, and we had worked out an alternative plan. But as I appreciate it, we had already worked on that one. The, I think there were other areas that apparently he felt uncomfortable with. So these things had been discussed. Jay, what do you, what do you say about well, that? Well, we had long discussion about the price of oil, and at Jim's suggestion, there was a consensus that we would reduce the price per barrel number uh, to accommodate the concerns that Jim had, even though the economists thought a higher price would have been appropriate. Uh, Cameron's concerns expressed dealt with other things with no details, just he didn't think the revenue estimates were going to be what they were. Um, but this is unprecedented. I mean, this is an, an estimate based upon a snapshot in time, and the estimates go up or down based upon what happens. And right. unfortunately, this was a reform put in place to make certain we didn't politicize our revenue estimate, and that's exactly what happened at the meeting. And of course, to be fair, Louisiana does not depend on the price of oil like it once did uh, in, in this forecast. It's so six, about 6% of the overall budget. Right, so that's much different. Th so the governor called this a political ploy. What's your thought well, on it that? Well, it clearly was a political ploy. It apparently intended not to fund what the legislature voted for in the event that new revenues were realized. And this means we're not going to be able to open the new juvenile justice facility in Bunky on time. It's going to affect the Department of Corrections budget. Uh, we didn't approve any forecast whatsoever, so it's going to impact us next year when we implement the proposed teacher pay raise. Right now, we don't have the additional money that would go to fund that teacher pay raise. So it, it's not a responsible way to handle the, the budget because we rely on economists giving us independent economic assessments of where we are in the state's revenue forecast. So a delay, so the delay just causes more heartache? Well, I mean, <laughs> at, at some point we'll have to have a number. We'll have to, and it will be an estimate. There will come a day, it, they may want to do it in January. I don't know exactly. I know Jay wants to do it much more fast, much more quickly than that. But at some point there will be, have to be a number and it will be an estimate. And the elements that are on, kind of uncertain in the budget and always will be uncertain be like corporate taxes we will not know about them until may or june that's too late to to make a number an estimate the income tax has a lot of very very built in it right now because of what the federal, federal government did in 2017 again we won't know for sure about that until May of this come year. So we have to make an estimate before that time for the legislature to do their job. And some of the things we know, the GDP is at a record pace in Louisiana right, right now. We've, we've seen those numbers. So um, that certainly factors into a rosier forecast. Well, of course, there's no question that we're, things have improved. And if you follow Cameron's logic, we'd never get an estimate until we knew exactly how much money we had. And as Jim says, there's no way to do that. There, there are two reasons why we need to act now. First, because we're trying to give agencies the authority to spend this year's excess as quickly as possible so they don't wait till the very end of the year, delaying opening Bunky, for example, this mm -hmm. $20 million facility. And secondly, we have to present next year's budget shortly after the first of the year, and we ought to be in a position to present a realistic budget based upon what the economists tell us is their best estimate of what revenue is going to be. And it should not be a depressed number. It should not be an increased number. It ought to be what the economists tell us is, is the best estimate right now. And that's what we have before us. The economists were almost in exact agreement on where we would be. Negligible differences, less than 1%. So we're very comfortable with those numbers. And I think Jim was comfortable with the number. There's no reason to delay except politics. And one last thing, the criminal justice reform and, of course, the teachers' uh, raises, uh, those are big items. Uh, the governor has touted as something he wants to have done. So if you're a teacher at home and you see this happening what's your reaction to that well why are they continuing to play games the legislature came in voted for the revenue the economists are telling us things are better and the revenue is going to be there tell us honestly what the revenue projection is so the budget can be set accordingly all right men thank you so much for being here always appreciate yeah. it good to have you thanks thank you Could voters in East Baton Rouge Parish set the tone for the rest of the state on the treatment of mental health and addiction issues? Right now, crisis stabilization centers are basically non-existent around the state. This is a place for those suffering a mental health or addiction crisis to go to on a short-term basis, instead of jail, instead of a hospital. A yes vote on December 8th by EBR voters would put one in the capital region. The face of this campaign, of this issue, is a father. 
I lost a, a son who died in Paris prison in 2013. I'm Bill O'Quinn, my son was David, and he suffered from schizophrenia. He had two college degrees from Texas. He had a master's degree from UCLA. About age 25, and that's a normal onset for schizophrenia, uh, he developed schizophrenia and he, he, he just kept degenerating and, and, and something bad was going to happen and, and it happened in jail. Now here to discuss the need for this type of crisis center, Dr. Bo Clark, the coroner of East Baton Rouge Parish, and Kathy Kleber, board chair for the Bridge Center, which is a nonprofit addressing mental health issues. Thanks so much Thank for you. being here. First, let me ask you, how could the very moving story, sad story of Bill O'Quinn and his son, how could that have been different? Had there been this type of facility in existence? Well, it Kevin? could have been very different. For, um, we would have a mobile assessment team that could have gone out instead of police and assessed him and made the determination that he didn't need jail or hospital, he needed treatment, and they could have brought him to a crisis stabilization center, which is what we are establishing if this tax passes. He died in jail, had like a, a wound of some type that uh, became infected. That's correct. Yeah, he, uh, he had a wound that became infected and ultimately led to a blood clot in his lungs. Uh, and certainly, you know, what we've done as a community and as a nation is we've begun to institutionalize our mentally ill in the prison system, and certainly that's not the appropriate place for them. So that's what we're trying to establish uh, with the crisis center is a, is a place to appropriately uh, treat people with mental health issues and addiction problems. We're talking about crisis and not for a long period of time. So what exactly goes on here? So we, they would come into the center. They would be assessed in terms of their needs. Um, some individuals might just stay till they sober up or and then they can be back, you know, they can go back home. Other individuals will need to stay a little bit longer, typically three to five days, um, where they can be stabilized, they can be referred for, for treatment, whether that's outpatient treatment or longer term inpatient treatment. They re could be referred and followed up for those treatment services so that they're not back out, out on the streets, uh, you know, relapsing and, and well, doing the whole cy cycle again. And, and the worst case scenario, they don't wind up is somebody that you would have to take a look at That's as correct. coroner. That's correct. Uh, this tax, uh, mental health tax, it has the support of city and parish leaders uh, in the capital region, uh, I mean, across the board, everyone. And, and it's interesting, it says cost the taxpayer $1.50 a month, but the benefits are astounding. So you would think people don't vote for taxes typically, but for $1.50 a month to establish this? And, and to be able to save, and what a lot of people don't understand, we're not only saving lives, we're also letting police get back onto the streets instead of waiting in emergency rooms with individuals that they have to try and get a bed for or bringing them to jail for them to be um, put in, in jail. We, they spend four to 12 hours of their time and they're not on the streets protecting public safety, which is where we want them. And these centers do not exist in Louisiana. Bo, I, I want you to talk about that a little bit. There is one place where one should be coming on board, but talk about the state right. so it's our, and the needs. It's our understanding that St. Tammany is uh, about to have a center as well. I don't know if it's in uh, where, what stage they're at at this point, uh, but nowhere in the state of Louisiana are there rapid stabilization mental health centers. Uh, we looked ac actually outside of Louisiana to other models uh, to kind of uh, create what we thought would be most appropriate and how to manage uh, our community and our, our, our patient population. Um, one thing that uh, you always talk about uh, is the, the tax issue in St. Tammany. They did not use a tax issue to open this, uh, this center to come. Um, but we mentioned uh, EBR as possibly being a model. Do you think that's really a, a, a truism here that people could look at and say, you know, hey, this is a need and we can afford that. A absolutely. And while St. Tammany is not using the tax, they are using local funding that they have available through other um, local local funding measures. But absolutely, we believe it's a model that should be used throughout Louisiana. A and I can tell you believe this is an urgent, urgent need. Absolutely. I mean, we're, 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 we're going to become responsible for taking care of this mental health population, whether we do that uh, through our prison system, and that we're certainly doing that now, or we do it what, what I would consider more appropriately uh, and more humane, more ethically, would be do it through a rapid crisis mental health stabilization. Center. And the money saved over the long term is incredible, it's, correct? Yes, 55 million over 10 years is what we anticipate through saving, not buying jail beds out of parish, as well as police time, as well as the other savings that we have with getting those individuals back into the community to be um, valued members. So a lot for people across the state to think of sure. as this topic, it's not going away, it's actually only getting worse. And 
and we address it. Right, and when we talk about savings, we're saving lives. Yeah, we're saving lives, absolutely. Thanks you so much for being here. We'll talk again. Thanks. Thank you. Forensic pathology expert Mary Mannheim brought LSU's Faces Lab to national prominence as its creator and director. She helped give anxious families answered as she helped solve mysteries of the dead. She became known as the Bone Lady. She retired from LSU three years ago, but her new career, it has taken off and it seems the sky is a limit. When you were at the height of your forensics career uh, at LSU, uh -huh. was there always a writer inside waiting to put something on pages? Oh yes, I've been a writer. Uh, I was a writer many years before I started forensic anthropology at LSU. I was okay. an undergraduate in English, and so I'd always had writing in my blood. Yeah, you did, and <laughs> then you wrote uh, the three the trilogy, you call it. Right, the three nonfiction books about cases I had worked on over the years, and uh, I love them all. I still love them all, and they still do very well. The, the Bone Lady, Trail of Bones, and Bone Remains. In all, you've written how many? I've written six books so far. I'm working on three more. Working uh, on three more, but your newest on one you have right here. In my newest mind. one I'm so excited about, Andre. Uh, it is uh, called Claire Carter, Bone Detective. A this young is, forensic is anthropologist is what she is. It's and children's book. It's a children's book. book, exactly. And she has a niece, a, an 11-year-old niece named Penelope, with whom she goes on cases. And they try to solve mysteries all across Louisiana. So the first one is the mystery of the bones in the drain pipe. How cool. And I'm working on the second one now. It will come out next year. But this was published by my new company. I've started a publishing company uh, called Os Liber Press. And Os Liber is Latin for bone book press. So oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Great. so excited about it, and my partner in this is Leah Wood Jewett, and Leah is an illustrator, and Leah has, has uh, drawn these beautiful, beautiful illustrations for the book that you'll see at the I'll, beginning of each I'll chapter. Take a look at it's this. so much fun. Yeah. Uh, it covers STEM um, items. It covers how a young 11-year-old girl wants to become a forensic anthropologist, yeah. and the mysteries that they go on that are taking place in Louisiana. You learn about the animals. You learn about unique places in our wonderful state. Well, so, so that's it's so really much fun. interesting that you. It's based in Louisiana, oh, yes. so you have the whole Louisiana culture Absolutely. to deal with and write about. Absolutely, and I've been going to all kinds of Ali uh, presentations, learning more about Louisiana uh, than I knew before, even though I grew up in Louisiana. So I'm incorporating those things into the books I write. Did the publishing company come just because you were beginning to produce so many? You well, felt I like, why not? I just always wanted to do something on my own, and uh, after I retired in 2015, I. Tra I've traveled the world and so I, when I came back finally to reality after I was in Ireland this summer I decided you know I, I really wanted to do something on my own so publishing was something uh, as an English major I was always interested in and it's a small company but we in the, after the new year we will be taking submissions from other people so it won't just be children's books it'll be books about all kinds of different things so uh, it's the beginning I hope of, of a successful small publishing company right here in Baton Rouge. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Does it operate out of your house? Or do you have no, a place? it doesn't. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't. It has a, a domicile. It's domiciled Good. in Baker, okay. uh, where we have office buildings, and so we have the warehouse for uh, the copies where they can be held. So, no, it, it has its own domicile. Uh, starting a publishing company is quite a challenge, I though. I can't imagine how difficult I had that no must be. idea, you know, how to do an ISBN number or how to get a copyright or how to fill out all the forms you have to fill out to start your own company. So, uh, it's been quite a challenge challenge but so much fun along the way. Did you ever see yourself as being someone who would gain the notoriety that you gained as heading up the Faces Lab and the cases that you cracked and the mysteries you helped solve? No, I never thought much about it, but it, you know once it took off, it, j it just rolled, and every time we turned around, we've worked on so many exciting cases, both in Louisiana and nationally, and so uh, it, it was just phenomenal in terms of what happened, so it just took on a life of its own. And it almost. seems like maybe uh, DNA evidence and oh, some other yes. things were coming of age yes. right at the right time. Oh, yes. So it was a perfect timing for there to be a super interest in what you were doing, which was so unique. 
Well, we started the data in, in 2006. We formally started a database for all unidentified and missing people in Louisiana, and uh, they are continuing it today. And it's the most complete database of its kind in the un entire country yes. for a state. And we've solved a lot of cold cases from all across the country. And through the use of DNA, cold case hits. We'll put the DNA, or have the state police put the DNA uh, into the national CODIS data database, and then it will get a cold case hit from someone across the country who's missing. And it is the most incredible feeling. I can tell that's like ah. something you're most proud of. I am so proud of the Faces Lab and our database. And uh, the young lady, Dr. Janesse Listy, who took my place, had been with me almost 20 years, and she's now the director of the lab. I miss the people. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily miss the work, uh, but I can make up stories about things. So yeah, that's what I'm enjoying now. That's what you're doing, so we will follow your uh, your burgeoning writing career and, and <laughs> publishing company. And, thank you. And all thank that. you so, so much. Great to see you. Great to see you, it's so you too. so much fun to have you here. Thank you. And you can meet Mary. Some book signings coming up in Baton Rouge on December 15th, 2 p.m. at Barnes & Noble City Place and then December 22nd, 11 to 1 during the day at Barnes & Noble Perkins Road, Mary Manheim. Now a reflection on a Baton Rouge native known mainly for his work as LSU's landscape architect, but who also crafted a massive collection of folk artwork that brought him worldwide acclaim. LPB's Will Lurker takes a look at the life of the legendary Ollie Steele Burden. The expansive landscapes of Burden Museum and Gardens. The tranquil environment of the LSU Rural Life Museum. The iconic magnolias planted throughout LSU. These magnificent achievements in landscape architecture can be attributed to legendary Louisiana native Steel Burden. Steel Burden is from Baton Rouge and he spent his entire life here. He never married. He was one of three children and they all resided on this property, Windrush Plantation at the time. A renowned landscape architect, Burden was responsible for conceiving and laying out the lush landscapes of Windrush Gardens and designing the outdoor layout of LSU's flagship campus. All the oak trees and magnolias and big crepe myrtles that we all celebrate at LSU, he put there, one man, from 1932 to 1970. In addition to his work in landscape architecture, Steel Burden is also known for his many pieces of period artwork that depicts the rural life he grew up knowing. The story goes that Paul Cox, who was a professor at LSU, said, Burden, if you're interested in sculpture, then take this piece of clay, and he threw a piece of clay at him and said, make something out of that. And he made a turtle, and he had it fired. And from then on, he started just practicing and playing with clay. He called it pinch art, and he would literally just pinch it out they were done in various clays, but he liked a Georgia clay, which was more of a white clay. And they would be fired with a white glaze, but a crackle glaze. So if you look at an old plate or an old platter from your grandmother, the, the glaze tends to crackle over the years. And he would uh, actually get India ink and fill in the cracks so that it would show up even more. So that's kind of his signature uh, finish. One time he got a, a, a collection of red clay by mistake, and so he went ahead and used it. Burden's clay figurines were more than just caricatures to Floyd. They were folk art commemorating life on the plantation. He did a lot of things like the, uh, the old quarter buildings and horses and mules, pulling a cart or pulling a plow. Because of his sense of humor, he started adding a lot of fun things to it. Things that happened all the time that people have forgotten about but he used to laugh at, like running to the outhouse because you have to go to the bathroom and opening the door and there's somebody in there. Every day for over 40 years, Bird would make up to three of these figurines. He is estimated to have crafted between 20,000 and 25,000 clay sculptures during his lifetime. He loved giving them away. So people would come in this corner and sit and just talk to him. Basically, if he liked you and thought you were interesting, he'd offer you one. So they're all over the world. Despite enjoying a national reputation, Burden ensured that some of his pieces would always remain in Baton Rouge. One of his most unique contributions to the community can be found at the Ollie Steele Burden Nursing Home. He did a series of biblical plaques 
they're put on the post in the walkway. And they tell every bit of the story from New Testament to the Old Testament. In addition to the clay sculptures, Burden also created numerous paintings that showcased the sheer beauty of the local landscape. His paintings, he never took seriously, but he loved copying paintings that he really liked. There's a painting called Blue Rhapsody, which is a swamp scene. It's kind of that bluish gray that you'll see right before dark. And that was a Newt Helder painting, but still added his own interpretation to it. To visitors of the Rural Life Museum, it would only be after his death that his artwork would begin to be sought after and sold. Believe it or not, the art that he did not take seriously, his paintings and sketches, are really the most popular. They're bringing the largest price. They're all over the city and all over the state and all over the country. And most people just cherish them. While Steele's achievements in landscape architecture may have left the most lasting landmarks on the Baton Rouge community, it's his clay sculptures and paintings that truly reflect the man's love for his homeland and extended it out all over the world. I'm Will Lurker with LPB. To see more about Burden's upbringing and life on the plantation, be sure to visit the LSU Rural Life Museum. It's open year-round from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's seven days a week. They are closed on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day. That's, of course, located in Baton Rouge. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.